Um, if I can now uh, invite Michael Flynn to the uh, lectern to deliver his paper. Thank you, Robert. Um, my paper this morning is going to be relatively short, but it deals with some of the most intractable problems that confront executors um, who are administering estates. I'm going to be talking about the tax and also the non-tax issues that arise when the testator's assets were held through trusts and companies. I think the title to my paper, or the, the publicity indicated that it was mainly about tax, but in fact, I, in writing the paper, I've realised that some of the non-tax issues are very, uh, are so closely associated with the tax issues that it's necessary to talk about both. So I'm going to be talking first about the situation where the testator's assets were held in a company. And I'm going to deal with both the period during the administration when the executors are required to realise the assets. And then I'm going to be talking about uh, issues that can arise during the administration of a testamentary trust after the administration is complete. And then I'm going to be uh, talking about issues that can arise in connection with the trusts. So, someone dies and one of their principal assets is shares in a private company. Well, once the executor obtains their grant of probate, they're under a duty to get in the trust, to get in the estate's assets, pay off the deceased's debts and, and distribute the assets in accordance with the will. Now, if the deceased died leaving shares in a private company, then strictly speaking, the only asset that the estate owns is those shares. It doesn't own the underlying assets. Unfortunately, testators often don't think in those terms. It's quite common for testators to think in terms of themselves owning the assets that really belong to the company. And that can lead to a couple of problems. The first problem might be that the testator didn't realise the company was even there and may have made directions in the will that are incapable of being complied with. A second issue that can arise, even if the testator is aware that the company um, was in existence, and that is that the testator may request the executors to become directors of the company and cause the company to distribute asset, particular assets to particular beneficiaries. Um, so, what, what, what can the executor do? Well, first of all, the executor may be required to realise the asset, to realise the shares in the company, to generate money to pay off debts or to pay specific legacies. The executor acquires the, the shares in the company with a cost base equal to the cost base that the deceased had in those shares, unless the shares were acquired by the deceased before 20 September 1985, in which case the shares have a cost base equal to their market value at date of death. In either case, the sale of the shares could trigger a capital gain in the estate. Alternatively, the executor might distribute the shares in specie to the beneficiaries. That might happen in order to avoid triggering a capital gain, or it might happen because the, the testator made a specific gift of the shares to a particular beneficiary. There also, the beneficiary will acquire the shares with a cost base equal to the deceased's cost base, or if the shares were acquired by the deceased before 20 September 1985, they will have a cost base equal to their market value at the date of death. So the capital gain effectively gets transferred to the beneficiary. And if the beneficiaries are, are not interested in holding on to the company, then they will be faced with the problem of realising the shares. Oftentimes, a private company can be difficult to sell. A potential purchaser May, may be very uninterested in acquiring a private company which could carry with it a whole lot of legacy liabilities. Um, so often the beneficiaries would prefer it if the executors could deal with that issue and try to, to get rid of the company. So what if the, the testator has requested that 
assets in the company are transferred directly to beneficiaries. Well, leaving aside the potential company law issues, from a tax perspective, a direct transfer of assets to beneficiaries could be disastrous. And the reason for that is that there are rules in the Income Tax Assessment Act which are, def which are designed to ensure that what are called disguised dividends are treated equivalently to a real dividend, that is, that they're treated as fully assessable in the hands of the recipient. In particular, Section 109, Capital C of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 provides that a payment to a shareholder or to an associate of a shareholder is deemed to be a dividend to the extent that the company has undistributed profits. Such a dividend would be fully assessable to the shareholder or the associate and without the benefit of any franking credits that the company might have. Associate is defined in such a way that if you're an individual, any trust from which you can benefit is an associate. And because under the Act, a deceased estate is treated as a trust, and the, the situation I'm talking about is one where the executives own all the shares, uh, it would always be the case that a beneficiary of the, of the deceased estate would be an associate of the, of the estate. So, so Division 7A would, would apply with its full force and effect. Um, that brings me to a, a war story about one of, one of these situations. This was an unusual situation in that it was a very wealthy estate where the deceased had no relatives. So she left all her assets to, I think it was about seven gift deductible recipients. She owned two investment companies and those investment companies had invested solely in shares in listed Australian uh, stock exchange companies. So the, sh the assets were really easy to realise. The problem was she bought them over a long period of time and they had huge unrealised capital gains. So the executors obtained tax advice from um, a pretty good firm and the advice they got was, well, sell the shares and then donate the cash to the DGRs and claim a tax deduction for the gift. And the gift, the deduction for the gift will offset the capital gains on the shares, which on the surface sounded like pretty good advice. Unfortunately, the tax office reviewed it and didn't like it and they came up with two arguments to deny the tax deductions. The first argument was that even though the gift was from a company, it was testamentary in nature. It was said that the executors were under fiduciary duties as executors, and so when they caused the company to make the gifts, it, um, it was a testamentary gift. The second argument the tax office had was that it wasn't a genuine gift, because the executors were the directors were acting in, in, in a capacity as executors, they were really obliged by the terms of the will to ensure that, those share, that the money reached the DGRs and so it wasn't a genuine gift. That case settled before the hearing in the federal court. Um, and and uh, my view is that the tax office probably would have lost, but uh, there was sufficient doubt about it for the charities to want it to be settled. And so effectively, a lot of the money went to the tax office rather than to the charities. A company in that situation could have um, either transferred the shares to the estate or sold them and then distributed a dividend to the estate, paid the tax on the capital gains, then franked a dividend to the estate and, and the estate could have on passed it to the DGRs and the DGRs could have claimed the franking credits as a tax refund. So there would have been, and the tax office accepted that, so there would have been a way of doing it that wouldn't have... Uh, wouldn't have involved trying to get a tax deduction for the donation. So it's probably an unusual situation, but I think it's quite an interesting one. So what else could the uh, executives do to realise the assets of the estate? Well, one possibility might be that they could cause the company to declare a genuine dividend. The downside of a genuine dividend is, of course, it's fully assessable, but at least then the estate would get the franking credits. So that's not such a bad option, really. 
Another alternative is that the company could return share capital. That's a great option, but it's really only going to be viable if, the, if it's a company that has a lot of um, share capital. And most, a lot of private companies don't have a huge amount of share capital. A further alternative is that the executives could wind up the company. That can be quite an attractive option if the company has large pre-CGT profits because a, a liquidator's distribution is treated as an assessable dividend except to the extent that it's paid out of share capital or pre-capital gains tax profits. In contrast, a dividend out of pre-CGT profits would be fully assessable. So winding up could be an attractive option. A final option might be that the company could simply lend the money to the estate. And often, if an estate has an immediate need for cash, that might be something that happens. The potential downside of that is that the loan could also trigger Division 7A. Uh, now, there are a number of people in the room involved in a particular case in which I've been briefed where that, in fact, did happen. There was an estate with a lot of assets, but those assets were held in companies and trusts that the executives controlled. <coughs> the court made orders that the estate was to pay certain legal liabilities out of capital, and the executives in, a, in an endeavour to raise capital, requested that the directors of the companies caused loans to be made to the state. Now, unfortunately, that's led to issues about whether or not Division 7A applies to those loans. Um, it also leads to another issue, which is how do you actually get the money out of the company into the estate in a form that uh, allows it to remain as capital rather than income? <coughs> And that's the next topic I want to talk about. You'll see in the paper that I, I spent a bit of time talking about the relevant case law on this issue. Uh, and there's now over 100 years of case law to say that even though if you look at a balance sheet of an estate, it might say that you've got a certain amount of capital, which is reflected in the value of the shares in a company, if that company distributes profits to the estate out of its undistributed profits, that distribution will be treated as a taxable, as a dividend which is income in nature. So effectively declaring dividends out of companies has the effect of converting capital into income. And in an estate where you have different income and capital beneficiaries, that, that can generate disputes between those beneficiaries because obviously the, uh, the capital beneficiaries are going to become very alarmed when they see the life tenant suddenly getting large payments of income out of what up until then had been treated as capital. And there's a couple of times that I've encountered that in practice and it's very difficult to find a way out of it. There are a couple of alternatives that an executor has for example, they may um, be able to cause the company to, to uh, distribute money by way of a return of capital rather than by way of a dividend. Another option might simply be to wind up the company. A liquidator's distribution is capital, not income. But if you've got a, an operating business, for example, you're not going to want to wind the company up. Um, So there are, there are quite a few cases in, reported where there have been disputes between beneficiaries on that issue. There are a couple of recent, more recent decisions where courts, where there, have been a, there has been a suggestion that courts might be more kindly disposed towards finding that distributions um, retain their status as capital rather than uh, convert capital into income. In the UK, there was a decision in Sinclair and Lee, and that case involved a demerger, ICI was split into two different companies. One, I think ICI continued as ICI, and it split off another company called Zeneca. And they claimed demerger relief from capital gains tax in the UK. And there were, I think, a lot of estates and trusts affected by this. Uh, one trustee applied for directions to the court in England about whether or not the distribution of shares in Zeneca was income or capital, 
and the judge held that it was uh, held that it was capital, which seems to be inconsistent with the prior case law. But in a, a WA case called Orr and, and Vent, the full court in, in Western Australia approved Sinclair and Lee without making any decision that's binding on any Australian court. The, the comments were purely obiter. So there may be some scope to argue that a distribution of, of a dividend out of profits could retain its, its status as capital. Another interesting question which really echoes some of the issues that Peter was talking about is what are the duties of executors who take on the role of, a, of directors of a company, the shares in which are owned by the estate? There's very little case law on this question, but it has arisen, the issue has arisen in the context of the executor's duty of impartiality between beneficiaries. So if you've got different uh, income and capital beneficiaries, this issue about converting capital into income can arise in the context of uh, companies in which the executors are directors. Um, one way it can arise, it used to arise in the past, is that companies used to be subject to a tax called undistributed profits tax if they failed to distribute a certain amount of dividends every year. And so to avoid a tax liability, directors often had to cause the company to distribute dividends. That, and, and that need to distribute dividends arose in a case called Reed Campbell in 1973. The directors there applied for directions from the court about whether or not they should cause dividends to be paid. And what the court said was that there were a couple of different alternatives that the directors had which would avoid the undistributed profits tax but which would preserve the capital status of the dividend. And the court, without telling the directors what to do, hinted that perhaps they should adopt one of the mechanisms that was available for preserving the capital status of the distribution. Um, and one, one mechanism, for example, was to declare the dividend, but to say in the declaration that the dividend related to the period before death, because that would result in the dividend having been treated as capital. So I think the answer to that question is that the director ha has a primary duty to the company, but um, if a particular course of action would, be, would cause no disadvantage to the company, then they are still under their duties as directors, one of which is to act impartially between the beneficiaries. Okay, so that brings me to um, assets held in trusts. Now, trusts are less likely to give rise to Division 7A issues because... Um, Division 7A, strictly speaking, applies to companies. However, Division 7A can still be triggered in relation to trusts in a couple of different ways. First, it's very common to come across trusts which each year distribute all their income to a company. It's equally common to find that the company then, that the money actually isn't paid out to the company. So the company either doesn't call on the payment or it lends the distribution back to the trust. Under section 109 capital D of division 7A, if a private company lends money to a shareholder and the loan is not repaid by the lodgement date, by the due date of lodgement of the company's tax return, the company is deemed to pay an unfranked dividend to the borrower equal to the amount of the, of the loan. Um, up to, subject to a limit, which is the amount of the undistributed profits of the company. So a loan to a company can potentially give rise to a, a serious tax issue. Now there are three ways of avoiding triggering a dividend in relation to a loan. The first is repay the loan before the due date of lodgement of the tax return. So, for example, the trust or an estate, if it has an immediate need for money, may be able to 
borrow the money but make sure that it gets repaid before the company has to lodge its tax return. The second possibility, and it should really be a last resort, is that you can request the tax office to exercise a power in section 109RB to disregard the application of Division 7A on the basis that the company or the beneficiary or some other person has made an honest error or inadvertent omission. The Commissioner has issued, I think, a practice statement about how he will administer this power. But it's a relatively narrow discretion. The final option, and the one that many take up, is that you, the company and the trust can enter into a written loan agreement which complies with Section 109 capital N of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936. Section 109 capital N requires that the loan has uh, an interest rate which is equal to what's called a benchmark interest rate and that the trust makes minimum repayments each year. If the trust fails to make the minimum repayments, then the shortfall can be result in a deemed dividend. Now, in addition to applying where there's a loan back to the trust, the Commissioner in 2010 issued a ruling and a practice statement indicating that he, that he would also treat unpaid trust entitlements that come into existence after 16 December 2009 uh, as loans which are subject to Division 7A. <clears throat> so you may encounter testators who have in place arrangements either under Section 109N or under one of these rulings that are designed to avoid the application of Division 7A. So it's very important that the executives get on top of that, those arrangements very quickly because you may find if someone's died, and particularly if they've been ill in the period leading up to death, that they've fallen behind in compliance with Division 7A. And so they might, you might need to speak to the accountant and, and find out what the accountant's been doing and work out whether there's something you have to do. For example, you might want to apply for an extension of time to lodge the company's tax return, or um, you may just need to ensure that the trust makes some payments so that it can comply with one of these loan agreements. Now, trusts are easier than companies in, in another respect, which is that payments from trusts to an estate wouldn't ordinarily convert capital in, into income. So if the trustee makes a payment out of corpus uh, into the estate, then that payment should retain its status as capital. Likewise, a distribution of income to the estate would, be, would retain its status as income. However, you still do have the, the problem from time to time that executives treat the assets that are in their trust as though they are assets of the estate. The testator cannot bequeath assets in the trust. However, testators can create mechanisms that allow intended beneficiaries to take control of the trust. For example, the executor might, sorry, the testator, before they die, could arrange for an amendment to the trust deed or for a, an appointment to be made under the trust deed to ensure that the appointor of the trust, that is the person who can dismiss and appoint a trustee, is an intended beneficiary. They can also ensure that an intended beneficiary is one of the directors of a trustee company, for example. Sometimes testators do try to direct dis the disposition of assets in a trust and they can also put mechanisms in place to enable that to happen, but it often falls onto the shoulders of the poor old executor to carry that out. For example, they might arrange for the executor to become the trustee of the trust, or they might arrange for the executor to become the director of the trustee company. In those circumstances, the executors need to decide whether or not they can carry out the testator's wishes expressed in the will. I've referred to some of the case law that uh, talks about what trustees can and cannot do. Trustees can't accept dictation from any person. Um, the trustee of a, of a discretionary trust is required to exercise the powers conferred on them by the trustee at the time of the exercise of the power, 
And having regard to relevant considerations in relation to any distribution. Now, one of those relevant considerations might, would be the directions that have been made in the will. But I don't think that those directions can rise any higher than, for example, a letter of wishes that um, a set law might create, for example. So that's the end of my paper, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, um, there being no further questions, thank you all for attending, and thank you for our speakers and their both very helpful papers. <laughs>